All right, so Scream 1996 opens with very, very famous uh, scene, sequence, with Drew Barrymore as Casey getting attacked by the killer. Well, first, a phone call. And I was just thinking every time I watch this movie, and I think all of the original Scream movies, I think our relationships to phones used to be so, we were so ruled by the, we were ruled by the phone, unlike now. But it was like a phone rings in the house and it's like, you answer that shit. You drop whatever you're doing. It is funny. Like there's nothing that you could be doing in the house. That's more important than if the phone rings, you need to answer it. The phone used to have its own room or like own, own spot, like its own table, its own moment in the house. Um, And now it's just the thing we scream for. Like, where's my fucking phone? Yeah. Phone used to, phones used to have their own booths, Matt. Own, own places and restaurants. Phones really? used to be escorted to a table if you were to get a call in oh a restaurant. Gosh, yes, and, on a platter. And and <laughs> these, this was not a wireless phone. This was a this was they they'd have a very long cord. Risking the life of other guests. Yes, just a cord stretched across the room. I'm of course just uh, getting this information from Mad Men. I would have never well, movies and television attended a, a restaurant important enough to get a call on a platter. I guess maybe it was just ingrained in people because when phones first came out, they designed the ring to be so loud that it could be heard throughout the house because you only had one phone in the entire house. And then you started getting, and here's a word I realized, the this this word will date a person's age if they say an extension. Pick up the extension. Because I guess the idea was the phone itself is just the one phone. Every auxiliary phone in a different room is just an extension of the well, how do you know where the mecca phone is what's the motherboard of a phone the mothership is the one you know in the, the main it's... phone in the phone room in the kitchen all right then i yeah oh. it always made so much more sense to me that i do you remember well number one do you remember when you first got a cordless phone in the house mm-hmm like what a big deal that was mm-hmm. only to realize that your mom bought the kind that has a really shit range mm. you're like fuck but um, do, do you remember that those phones came with like a mama phone and then there'd be like mm-hmm. another one that was a baby? Oh, sure. But it's just like the mama phone had like an answering machine on it or something. And the well, baby. Here, I could tell you what the mama phone is the one that actually plugs into the that actually plugs oh. into the phone line. And then oh. the baby phone just uses that sick that wireless signal. How could that baby? Uh huh. Sucking at the phone teat. Yeah. So anyway, I'm always a little bit. um. I'm like, no, nah, memory. Whenever uh, Casey picks up the landline phone, oh fuck, they're both landline. Uh, when, when Casey picks up the corded phone to answer the first call, because I guess she's in the the main phone kitchen area of yeah, room. It's in the phone room. And I'm like, no, nah, Casey hides with us with a cordless. Oh, that's a good point. What is going on? And then and then I realized that fucker calls her too many times. And every time she, he calls, she has to just keep picking it up because it's like, I don't want to be killed, but I don't want to miss the call. Because well, this one could be my boyfriend. Yes. Okay, now this one could be my boyfriend. This one, or this one is my family. Killer. No. And, and I mean, I guess it had to be true that spam calls were just way more um, rare. You just, you mainly got important calls. I guess. Or maybe the calls that are important are so important that you just wade your way through the the spam. Do you remember when caller ID came out? Well, Scream makes that that easy to figure out. I bet it was 1998. Hmm, yeah, something like that. I mean, cause it's a big deal. And it used to caller be... Caller ID, motherfucker. So you could buy the caller ID device, but you had to subscribe as an yes. add-on to the phone company to be able to see information on it. Or it would just show you phone numbers. It wouldn't tell you who the phone number belonged to. Like a pager. And this is another thing that kids... The kids these days, they won't know what it was like. You started to know <laughs> phone numbers by... Last name, comma, first name, middle initial of whoever was the account holder of the. So your friend called you and be like, oh, Evans SL. That's my friend Brandon or whatever. That's how you get to find out that some people's names don't match their parents' names and who exactly. has gotten a divorce. Uh-huh. Somebody's living with a step parent. Busted. You got it. Ashley. Now. All right. This opening sequence. So. I was trying to figure out Drew Barrymore obviously was in ET in 1982 and I'm looking at her filmography and there's like a handful of movies leading up to this. I mean, she's in Wayne's world too. She's in Batman forever. She's in Woody Allen's everyone says I love you, but there's like a lot of movies where she's the lead actress and I've never heard of any of them. Have you heard of, of course, poison Ivy fucking shit is like 
Okay. Poison Ivy. What? What is? It stars Drew Barrymore, Sarah Gilbert, Tom Skerritt, and Cheryl Ladd. My dad would like that. Cheryl Ladd. She's like a seductress, right? Like she's a younger girl that like gets a guy to cheat on his wife or something like that. But she's poison. She's got other motives. That's my memory. So she would have been like 16 years old at the time. Yeah. Okay. Gross. Uh, I mean, what? Gun crazy. No place to hide. Um, doppelganger. What about Boys on the Side? When was that? Boys on the Side. Yeah. This is uh, this is 95. Okay, so that was before this. This is before Scream, yeah. Yeah, that that would have that was a big role for her because it was a dramatic role. Showed like she could be a real actress. She was like a big deal in my head before this movie came out. But maybe it was more just like, oh, you're that notable person. I've enjoyed you in a couple of things, but you seem maybe a little too old to be in this role. But when they talk about her in Scream, when the you know uh, uh, the producers and stuff talk about her, they're like. You With Drew Barrymore, that was the big name. And it's like, oh, Drew Barrymore's on board. Well, that means... Yeah, no, you're right. This filmography is confusing me. That's, um, what, that's why I bring it up. Because like, I'm trying to figure out... When did Wedding Singer happen? After a lot later. Because that's my favorite one of hers. Uh, Never Been Kissed is another one that would... In Home Fries, all those would have been movies I liked. Um, I'm, um, Poison Ivy, go back up. I'm, ju- I'm trying to figure this out with you. This is strange. Irreconcilable Differences. Show me the cover to that one, please. I, Ryan O'Neill, Shelley Long. I'm sure I Barrymore. saw it, but it wasn't one of my movies. This is, but this Show is still me her Far as From a Home. Kid. I know, I know, I could read Far From Home. No, 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 no. Man, I don't know. What was like her big? It has to be. It has to be Girls on the Side, Boys on the Side. Boys on the Side. Yeah, that, that and that looked like it was a little bit. Show of a me big Bad hit. Girls. Oh, Bad Girls. Yeah, for sure. That was like, and that's a good movie. It's like the female version of uh, Young Guns. Hmm. That was that. That one's actually a solid movie. I'd watch that. I'd okay. give that a whirl. Directed by Jonathan Kaplan. Okay, Mary Stuart Masterson from mm-hmm. uh, at, from AG, I know from uh, that movie. Fried For Green some Tomatoes. reason, if a woman has three names, I remember who she is. Really, and who plays the other woman in in uh, Fried Green Tomatoes with three names? Does she have three names? Well, you know, I think her first name is hyphenated, so it's actually two names. So, okay, you get a pass. Uh, okay, great. Then I don't remember. Mary Louise, Mary Louise Parker. Who you do the best impression in your repertoire is of her. Well, thank you from that movie. I agree. Go ahead and give us some, something. Iggy, if you love me at all, you'll turn around and. <laughs> it's just Iggy right bringing out. me a pie. Just walk right out that door, okay? <laughs> oh no, just Iggy giving me a pie. <laughs> pie. She's always got to be deep in thought, and she's got a trail. That's just papa. All right. I remember on that episode, a lot of it was just like, what pills is she on? Why is she on? Why is she acting like that? But it's just the distant stare of an abused woman. Yeah. Who has a station in life that is what it is. And what the fuck are you going to do about it? So this in opening sequence, this celebrated masterful opening sequence that we're not talking about. Oh, uh, right. It's good. You like it? I love it. It's my second favorite part, as we already said. Yeah. I was thinking one of the big innovations of this movie in the slasher genre is it really makes you sit with how upsetting the violence is, at least with this opening scene, mm, yeah. the violence on her boyfriend and then the violence on her. You 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 see the uh, the gutting. A lot of entrails. Yeah. You, you kind see of the forget entrails. that in subsequent movies. And then a thing that slasher movies rarely do is then the parents come that and witness. Is rough. Yeah. And you get the thing with with the mom picking up the extension and hearing her daughter. I can hear her. I can hear her. Uh, I hear Kaisy. Stop. She doesn't have a country accent, Mad. Everyone does in my. Okay. It, well, you took away the power just now, didn't you? Um, baby? Like, I, yeah, no, there's something so terribly real. I, I, I'm glad the rest of the movie doesn't go on like that, and nor do, like, movies that come after it. They keep the fun level up. Oh. Uh, while still keeping the stakes high enough, but I, I couldn't have too many more scenes like that and still be a fan. It's right, too but hurtful. having one at all, it it is it made me realize you don't often see this in the slasher movies. The parents are usually removed. Okay, and here's why I think that they do it. I think that they had to make this make it like this is not just a victim. This is just not some girl waiting for a boyfriend um r- running around town. This is this is this could be you. This is your girl next door. The, her parents came home and discovered this. This ruined their lives in this town. Just this one thing. So then you smash cut to the kids, the, the core four people, five five people, five kids of the movie. And then think about the way Stu and, well, basically Stu is talking about it. Yeah. And the way the well, kids are acting. Rose McGowan too, because Nev Campbell's like, she sits next to me in English. You mean she sat next to you in English. 
When did jawbreakers happen? Later. Okay. Um, it, and I guess okay, they didn't they didn't just witness the whole thing. Well, I mean, okay, a couple of them did. Um, but I do feel like it's supposed to maybe make you feel like how detached we are mm -hmm. around a, 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 a horrible tragedy, but that they're sitting right next to a person who experienced the most uh, recent and similar thing and still acting like that. I don't, it just it seems a bit unbelievable to me that a school, the kids would be mean enough in a school to go get the same costume and run around with it after a second and third attack. Mm -hmm. If it's this, this two, these two kids from the school that that's, bad enough but um when it when it's clearly serial you don't buy the costume and run around at school it's it's a little unbelievable for me movie I, well, town I, I think that it is very deliberate i don't know have, have you watched dawson's creek or did you ever so i don't Didn't know kevin it. williamson's attitude about teenagers from that but if i was just looking at this movie i think there's a big undercurrent of like just teens today are too fucked up yeah and even the media but i can't necessarily tell like he he pans over the school and you have all the reporters and but before you get to gail weathers there's another one who's like the teenagers are into the occult mm -hmm. and i i know that the movie doesn't actually think that's happening no. but is is his attitude as a 30 year old person and 30 year olds generally like the fucking kids today or so i wasn't like that we weren't they, they have the thing with the sheriff saying like 20 years ago, I never would have said a teenager could do something like that. But kids these days, he's like Tommy Lee Jones in No Country for Old Men. I guess I thought it was more of a commentary on like rich kids and like kids that don't have a lot of trauma in their lives normally. These big giant houses, all of them, they, it takes it takes you to three houses, right? And they all have an upstairs. Yeah. They all seem pretty well off. Um, no, Sydney's house, like in, in a, like a winery, uh -oh. basically. It's in a, it is. It's, it's in a majestic country. People, people visit that house. Yeah, to like, buy truly, that souvenirs. house probably costs ten million dollars in the stay. 90s. It's a bed and breakfast. Um, but maybe just the cruelty of of laughing at tragedy from their castles, or you know, from their high their high status. I don't know. Maybe, but, I, but then also maybe it was it was just kind of like the thing to do in the nineties was make movies and shows about kids that had lots and lots of money. It just it's just more interesting and more like pretty to look at. Mm -hmm. Um, you're right. This, is this a movie saying like kind of like the it thing where like this town is a little wrong, but it doesn't seem to be the town. It seems to be the kids because the adults are the ones saying. What's going on here? I don't know. It's not fucked up enough. No, but it, I would. I, I I think that I think that there is an element of Kevin Williamson as already at thirty years old and Wes Craven at fifty six being like these fucking kids. All right, your theory with stays. Their MTV. You win. Thank you. <laughs> so then we meet our heroine Nev Campbell as Sydney Prescott typing on her computer. She uses the computer. She's Logging smart, data. I guess. And then Billy Loomis, Loomis from a uh, right. Psycho. Psycho and Halloween uh, comes in and he's like, I was watching this lame O TV cut of the exorcist. And uh, I know we watched in scary movie. They, they point out this joke, like what? what? Cause he says like, there was a TV edit. So they cut out all the good stuff. What good stuff is he talking about from the exorcist that they cut off? Uh, well, the romantic moment of the, of the small child using the crucif crucifix to let Jesus fuck her. Yeah. That beautiful little moment of becoming a woman. That we all, yeah. I mean, we've all been there. You don't think there's, I mean, it's got to be all the profanity, right? Let Jesus fuck you. Okay, I'm clearly just on this scene. Um, your mother sucks cocks in hell. I mean, mo what I was wondering is what's left of the movie when you take those things away? I just assume teenage boy saying that he means either the nudity or the hardcore violence, but that movie doesn't have either. It has gross stuff. It has well, violent yeah, it has that. sexual yeah. assault to a child since it's it's not the child doing it to themselves it's a demon but you don't see it yeah but you that kid wakes up with the, just head. a destroyed vagina i mean you know it's it's sexual assault and, and vi violent sex with an object is <laughs> it's quite graphic um but what was the question um more of a comment really oh that was that's an interesting thing that you said that that when a boy says that a normal teenage boy that they're talking about they didn't get to see the boobs like like in the beginning of Carrie that there's full bush in the credits of of the opening credits of Carrie like yeah you can chop that off real easy and make a TV edit a, a normal kid would bring that up but that's like your first huge hint that 
Billy isn't right mm-hmm. is that he's he wants the gratuitous violence and horrific uh, shit spewed out of this child's mouth. He's twisted. Right. Him saying the exorcist like tells you something like it's not like he's talking about casual watching of the exorcist. Yeah, I just don't feel like that was like a pastime then. Yeah, Cat, well, what about MTV? It. No, but Cat, you could name you could name any kinds of a, a Friday the Thirteenth, but they cut out all the good stuff. Oh, they didn't show you the decapitation in the boobs. I got gotcha. you. Something edgier about The Exorcist, but all right. Another thing I noticed a uh, second time watching the movie is he says, "I it occurred to me I've never snuck through your bedroom window," and that right there is a tell like he is defining himself too much by tropes that he sees in oh, yeah. movies and TV. Like a like a very is a well studied um, observation of a uh, of a psychopath. He 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 acts the way he thinks he's supposed to, and he is obsessed with TV and um, when in real life. Is that actually a thing most people do is sneak through each other's bedroom windows? No, but it happens in movies and TV all the time. Constantly. Just because you can't go through the living room. It's not as like easy. We need, we need a private scene with the kid. Just put a kid through the kid's window. Yeah. So, yeah, he's like, hey, uh, what's wrong with us? We used to be we used to be hot and heavy on and then, our way to an NC-17 rating. We are a solid R rating on our way to an NC-17. Mm-hmm. And then something happened. I don't know what. It seems it's a big deal to you. I remember thinking it was meh. <laughs> what was it? That's so weird. The death of your mother, and now we're <laughs> gruesome murder and rape of your mother. Yeah, that you walked in on. You saw it. Mm. I forgot that Sid finds her. And uh, and now we're barely even a PG thirteen. But if and she's like, so what? What stud bucket? Did you think you could come over here and we'd start producing some raw footage? And he's like, no, I thought we could just do some over the clothes stuff. And I wouldn't, like, I wouldn't okay. dream of breaking your no panty rule. Okay, condescending. And After her dad does almost walk in, just like she said was going to happen. Uh-huh. Then let's do heavy petting. <laughs> yes, and then, uh, uh, and then she's just like, okay, and then they start, and then he leaves, and yeah, all right, Nev Wait, Campbell. He immediately goes to break the no panty rule, Matt. Oh, he yeah. is not a person that keeps his word. And she's... she's that's just guys doing guy stuff. And there you have it. <laughs> All right. But that's when she stops it. It's not like she was like, oh, let's make out for four seconds. He started doing more. And she's like, clearly we can't do this. And then mm-hmm. he says, God, did you know what you do to me? My blue balls, my fucking throbbing balls. I think he says you're such a tease. Yes, I know. Which is just the same. Oh, God. It tri- it's triggering all these things. He asked to kiss she said yes, and now she's the fucking tease. I know. I called Lacey a tease once. She hasn't gotten over it. Because it's not the first time I was called a tease. No, I'm saying you've never called me a I've never called you a tease. Oh, I just accepted that you had. <laughs> All men do. We're in our 30s. The mailman yesterday. Tease. No, it's a male woman. Um, Nev Campbell was on Party of Five mm. starting in 94, so she was a big deal already. Skeet Another Ulrich. one I hadn't seen. Skeet Ulrich, he was also in The Craft the same year, mm. later this month, with Nev Campbell. Uh, later, he'll be in As Good As It Gets, Ride With The Devil, Paul Schrader's Touch. So he's like, oh, tour directors are like putting him in stuff, but it doesn't really. What is he in As Good As It Gets? He is. The um, mean neighbor, junkie, the guy that beats up the gay guy. I don't remember. I think it is. I don't. That, that doesn't like some sound troubled right. kid. I forget how someone gets access into, um, to Greg Kinnear's. I was really going to impress myself oh. by saying that. No, it I, I, it wasn't coming to me. Oh, okay. I I want to say he's a troubled kid, but he seems like he'd been too old. But I guess he. I think I remember say, s- 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 uh, him playing too young in that movie. Okay, because it's like a law; he has to keep his greasy hair. So there's no way they gave him any an adult role. He would have had to wash it. But he's like he's like this young up and coming kind of brooding actor. That now, you know, James L. Brooks is putting him in his movie. Ang Lee's putting him in his movie. Paul Schrader's putting him in his movie. But he doesn't really have a movie career that takes off like it that. fizzles he, out. But, I mean, look at his filmography. He's constantly on TV shows. Like, oh. he's he's doing fine. He did the reverse. Reverse Nev Campbell. 
Yes. Well, I mean, started in movies, went to shows. Gotcha. Um, but both of us were like, where, where has Skeet Ulrich been? And then I pull up his filmography and it's all TV shows, like, you know, 20 episodes a year of a TV show on a network. And, you know, no one I know has ever watched it. Okay. Hey, I, I meant to point this out. I've been watching the football with my dad this season. How could you? Yeah. And, uh, I've realized for, I don't know, my entire life, <laughs> a, um, you know, the saints play on Fox and the Fox broadcasting network will like air its promos for upcoming for brand new TV programs. Mm -hmm. And my dad will be like, Matt, you're going to watch that every fucking year. And I've never ever in my life said yes. Or do you watch that? I've never said yes ever. And it's still the show. The preview starts coming on. I'm like, I bet he's about to ask. And then he does, Matt, you're going to watch that. Hope springs eternal. He wants to wants to watch things you're going to watch. But he's not going to watch it. Why is he asking? He's. Ma I have no idea. That sweet man. Yeah. He is a sweet man. Okay, that's these two. He's making chitty chat, Matt. Matty chat. We go to the school. We meet our we meet our gang of kids. The rare blonde Rose McGowan moment. I don't know of another blonde Rose McGowan role. I guess they just needed to contrast her with Sydney because they she, yeah. she, they dyed her hair for this. Yeah, that makes sense. Like they wrote it as blonde. And well, uh, and she kind of plays a little. Bit. She's always smart. Rose McGowan can't help herself. She just seems intelligent and uh, ready for action. That is, you're right. When I'm doing getting screenshots of the movie, I'm like, yeah, she's doing a lot of like kind of ditzy blonde. it's all put on though it's like she's putting it on but because it's rose mcgowan you're like no you're you're a sinister little uh uh terrorist mastermind behind there oh i'm like, just just because of, just cause of jawbreaker. competent okay but yeah when women are competent in jawbreaker mastermind. she's evil <sighs> anyway what were you saying about i love rose mcgowan i'm a big fan too. um you know, with Stu is Matthew Lillard and Randy is Jamie Kennedy. And I like that when you see these guys all together, it is it is more like a real high school group where they're not actually all friends. Two of them are friends yep. and they're just kind of linked. There's the awkwardly. connector friends. Yep. yep. Nev is the or Sid is the connector friend between Randy and um and the rest of the group. Probably they, they actually hang out. They actually talk. And and obviously there's just something about Billy that he's kind of aloof to everyone but Stu. Mm -hmm. And Stu and Randy are friends, but later like Stu like and Randy friends. don't appear to be actual friends because he's like very menacing to him. For sure. But you get the sense that they probably grew up together. So they have this like, sh that, like I talk to you, you talk to me, we talk. This isn't mm -hmm. weird because he's kind of confiding. In him. And when he knows Stu is uh, Billy's like m closest thing to a best friend. Um, but well, obviously, we figure out there's just no way to really be friends with Stu or Billy. Mm. I'm mm. sure the friendship's always been kind of shit and surface. And he makes fun of you when it makes sense to make fun of you when you're not looking. Yeah. I've never, I've never, you usually see in movies, you see groups of friends where everyone is friends. And I've yeah. never had that. I've never, mm -hmm. I mean, I talk about never having friends. I did have friends, but yeah, my friend groups were never like that. It was always like, I'm the connector and the other two people, if I were not there, would not be talking to each other. I think that's always a little bit true, but I think some groups end up gelling better than others. But there's always that weirdness of like, wait, I brought you two together. Now you guys are doing things without me. I mean, it's just there's it's just always a balance and it's hard to find a group that can strike that balance and then it not become an issue in some other kind of way. So they're talking about the murder of Casey. They're like, how could you even kill, gut somebody? And and uh, and and Matthew Lillard is like, you take a knife and you gut them from butt to knot. And then <laughs> Skeet Ulrich is like, hey, it's called tact, you fuck rag. Right. I know. I wrote down every fucking insult that someone calls somebody else. But when you're looking for it, you do realize that neither of them ever let any kind of like fake give a shit seep out. All they do is kind of hold in their um their urge to like be super giddy and excited about what they've been doing and in fact when like you can tell who did what like they're wearing a mask the whole time but they they hint toward who did what crime mm, okay. um, th while you're watching um because uh, you know sue's very annoyed at one point with someone uh, uh, implying that billy did anything because so it's Stu that murdered casey yeah, I do that. Is do, do we think Billy is present at the murder of yeah. Casey? Okay. Yeah, the the, the um just the 
physics of it. They're they're together every time, um, even when the, just the stalking is happening. That's my sense. They don't they don't go out ghost facing unless they're going to do it together. I mean, I think that's kind of the path. Oh, what do they find out? One of them was doing it. I want that. I think it'd be. I'd a watch whole a thing. TV show about this. If I, they make a Scream TV show, that's what it should be. And they, they have made a Scream TV. They really should make this exact movie over again, but just from that perspective. Tell me what this looked like from what they were their end. That would be so interesting to me. Jesus Christ! If we knew we if we knew people at fucking at you at comcast you could walk in and pitch that i know well especially if these actors still look this way like that should have been screamed too just the hijinks behind the scene and they add such weird camaraderie and then like hate for each other and like at what point did billy decide he was going to actually way too intensely stab Stu? i mean that seemed very intentional that Stu was going to die i don't think he ever trusted him to keep the secret yeah and i think a little gay panic from from billy he can tell Stu Stu's in love with him all right, you you don't think that's true? No. No, I think I think I think Lillard is kind of playing as like he kind of hero worships Billy. That could be true, but or, I I don't see it as, as sexual. Hmm. Um. Well, but I mean, like the sta- stabbing each other that is in, stabbing in slashers is always uh, sexually charged because mm. you are penetrating somebody else, and then these big you know tough guys start stabbing each other. It's there if you're looking for it. I'm looking now. The school is abuzz with talk of Drew Barrymore dying. Principal Henry Winkler calls Sydney into his office, and then we meet Dewey, David Arquette. What do we think of David Arquette? Oh, it's a weird, a weird character, but it totally. But Arquette makes it work. Mm-hmm. Um, it is a weird character. It's strange. It's, it's, I've never seen it done before. It's this. Um, it's in a police officer that's like kind of risen in the ranks a little bit, but still lives at home with his mom and is constantly being like talked down to. By everyone, by everyone, but he name? does a good job, so he still gets to do stuff at the police. Force. His name is Dewey, which is just very childish. But because yeah, that's he's, not his name, mm-hmm. Dwayne or Dwight. Dwight, one of those. He, he is like a Tim Burton hero, uh, like plucked from from that kind of we like just a just a beta male um, kind of cowardly hero plucked into this movie. It's very it's but it's part of the alchemy of this movie. It, for sure. I mean, I mean, and I, I would love to know, like, did Arquette come up with this, like, way to play this character? Or did he know that this guy lived with his mom? So he kind of made that fit. Um, but no, he's completely competent and and brave. He's not a coward ever. Mm-hmm. And that's yeah. why this that's why the evolution of Dewey works and why you can start to buy that. Because it's clear that Gail Weathers is obviously hitting on, on him at least the first and second time to get access but she's charmed by him every time. And then it just kind of becomes yeah. real at some point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, you're right. He's not, he's not a coward. He just, he just presents as cowardly. Everyone but undermines he does the brave thing. There are so many, and with a sister that looks like that, she's popular. Anytime she walks into a room, everyone's listening. And she's just so fucking sh- c- cutting your balls at any chance. <laughs> You know, you're going to need, it's a small town. Tate, he's my superior. The janitor's your superior. Everyone laughs. Um, I love Henry Winkler over the ad speaker saying, remember your principal loves you, <laughs> but so inappropriate, uh, but still really sweet. Uh, 23 year old Sydney gets off the bus from high school and walks into her giant empty house. And then what happens? Well, okay. So t- we learned that Tatum is a cheerleader, which seems a little against that kind of person's type. And it doesn't seem like she'd be into that, but whatever, she's a cheerleader. And so she's going to, she doesn't want said to be alone because at this point has he contacted her the killer i don't think so no um so she gets off the bus which stop it you guys are at least juniors if not seniors no one your age is riding the fucking bus you weirdo um but it's to make her seem alone and she just goes in her house and kind of starts packing her stuff because she's going to stay with tatum and dewey um while her dad's away and I guess she doesn't have a car and that makes her more vulnerable and mm-hmm. dependent on her friends for to yeah. drive her around. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And and you still want to get the idea that like she lives too far away to help. This movie does a really good job of making every location too far away to help. Or they, they none of I mean when they go to the party at Stu's house, that long country road, I mean that's for, you know, you're supposed to feel the distance. So you're kind of surprised when the cops get there. Mm-hmm. And and Sid, when you see those like huge views of of the mountains, where does this fucking person live? Like, I mean, no one is around here. And obviously they make a whole point of saying Casey lives in the middle of nowhere. Um so 
I don't know. She's pretty relatable. She's just in a big empty house collecting her things, waiting for someone else to pick her up. She's not really in control and she needs protection. And um, takes a nap on the sofa. She falls asleep. And when she wakes up, it's dark. And it's always bummed me out. That's always bummed me out. I get anxiety for her when she lays down on the sofa at 545. I'm like, Sid, that's a bad time to take a nap. Don't you do it. And you're going to wake up and the, the, it's going to be nighttime. And you're going to look at the clock and you'll be like, oh, my God, it's eight o'clock in the morning. But no. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> then the killer calls and she's like, Oh, Randy, you're such a, you're such a screw fuck. Yeah. I mean, they really go on and on with that. It's a, uh, maybe every movie that uses this trope does it for too long, but it's like, I think you can tell that this is not Randy a much sooner than you figure it out. I'm actually, I start to kind of mix all of the attack scenes on Sydney into one big one because there's like four, five, I don't know, scattered. Mm -hmm. And some of them are super short, like the one in the, um, and the bathroom at the school. Well, this is, you know, she doesn't, she's not aware of that the killer calls you first. So no, um, I know. she has no reason to like, I know. Yeah. So it's, uh, I was just trying to think what, how much happens here, but I did not, I did not remember that her thinking it's Billy happens that fast. Yeah. And just having your final girl encounter the killer 25 minutes into your slasher movie right. is weird in and of itself. Right. It happens they really fast. It. Yes. And the, the killer comes and she fights him off. And then Billy goes, comes to her window and she's like, oh my God, you're the killer. Right. But then, but they do it just well enough that, you know, it's like, oh, was that an accident in the movie? Because you don't know there's two, but the timing makes no sense. He did not have enough time to leave the door he was pushing on to get up and over a roof and all that, you know. So it suspends disbelief just enough. But then the phone falls out of his, out of his jacket. And it's like, well, what the fuck's he doing with a cellular? But is the idea, is their plan, I mean, it's stupid to try to dissect what their plan is. That's why I want the movie. Why, uh, they want to give her a red herring right now? They, is all of this just so that she can start to suspect and then not suspect Billy? I think they want to get her the phone. Um, because by them tracing and figuring out his phone activity, God, something something tracks it back to the dad's phone yes because they can clone the dad's phone yeah leave the phone here and then that's because they're setting up that they're, they're framing the dad right otherwise well i mean yeah otherwise i'm not sure what they're trying to achieve here but um they definitely god yeah i don't know well the cops show up they find out the killers left the mask behind so now we have a we, we the, the cops have the mask. I'm like, okay, so this is just a, a mask you can buy at a store. And then at the precinct, they can't get in touch with Sydney's dad for whatever Look reason. Look at his face. Look at his face. It's always bothered me how shitty um, Billy looks out at the office he's sitting in at the police uh, station next to Sid, um, who's so upset that they've put a little blankie on her. <laughs> but but they but it, but not so upset that they don't get her out of st scolding dif distance from the fucking killer. Oh, uh, well, this is mass like a, murderer. It's like a little Mayberry town. They don't know what they're doing. Look at they, it, look at his they face. They never had to deal with look this before. Little face. Yeah. yeah. And the way he's looking at her, her expression doesn't make sense. She's like, <laughs> "What's going on? You mad? Hey, big guy. Is this better than sex?" You know they're 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 inter they're interrogating Billy. And he's like, no, I have uh, my alibis and stuff. And they're like, we don't believe you. And he's like, well, my cell phone records will show that I didn't. Well, no. First, what does a teenager need with a cellular telephone? And he's like, they've all got them now, Chief. And we just uh, don't ever see him. They're gonna run his um, run his cell phone records, and that will prove whether or not he's the killer. But they got to keep him overnight because it'll take that much time and you uh, meet his dad and his dad is like somehow perfectly not warm but not not warm and and greasy just like billy mm -hmm. <laughs> and attractive but eh, small town attractive um but bad dad uh uh bad dad where's the lawyer where's your because you do not son do we shut not, your fucking mouth right now when we don't have a lawyer in the room with do us do we not know that his dad isn't a lawyer if his dad is a lawyer, you know what you do. If you're, then you should know even more. We're getting another lawyer here. He's a business dad. He's, he knows what he's doing, Matt. No, okay. you're right. Well, just, just so you all know, people. Get a lawyer. Get a fucking lawyer if you talk what to the cops. What if the FBI wants to talk? Especially get a lawyer. You get a lawyer for that one too. It's the Super same thing. Super get a lawyer. It's yes. The same thing. Okay. Thank you for that setup. No, I'm serious because um, when I was the listening FBI to a called. pod, no, a, I was listening to a podcast about 
the Eric Adams indictments and the guy was saying, if you've done crimes, don't talk to the FBI. I'm like, that's an option? <laughs> you just tell them no? But I'm sure what he meant was get an attorney. Mm-hmm. So I'm just curious. I like when they have their texts that are like, all right, after we've done our crimes, please delete these. Remember to delete our crime texts. I always do. Mm-hmm. So nice of him to have made that clear. I love that there's a certain, you can be the mayor of New, New York. You can rise right, to that station in life. That We're not talking about Scream right now. I'd be unaware that deleting a text message from your phone doesn't delete it from the, the universe. Right. It it's, still exists somewhere. It doesn't even work for cheating, guys. Okay, the, even the example there that were like, I love that I love that Eric Adams thinks that it's like uh, cheating on your wife to fool the FBI. Just delete, <laughs> delete, delete. And I'm like, even then, even the, a wife who thinks they've been cheated on knows you can find them. Mm-hmm. Matt over here sweating. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally. That. Totally. <laughs> How do you do that? <gasps> okay, so okay, so they leave the the precinct, but Gail Weathers is there, and she's like, "Sydney, Sydney, uh, Gail Weathers, come, come, real care to comment." And she's like, "Oh, hi, Gail, super bitch," and then punches her because these Pow. two they have history because Gail covered Sydney's mom's brutal murder at the hands of Cotton Weary, and uh, Sydney doesn't like things that Gail will be saying about her in an upcoming book. Or something like that. Yeah, you're not totally sure. You're thinking, okay, she's mad that this woman sensationalized something that was so traumatic and kind of like prolonged my trauma by being so involved in it. But then you realize Sid was probably always a little bit iffy about her being the one that put someone on death row. They should have never put that on a kid to choose to say, yes, that is him for sure. Like the whole court case hung on her eyewitness testimony. And and what she doesn't like about Gail's book is that Gail has j- thinks it doesn't make sense. She spent time with Cotton Weary. She's uh, you know ninety percent sure that it's that Sid picked the wrong person, and that's what Sid doesn't like is that she's been telling lies. Like, well, no, she's an investigator. Well, I know, I know, this is an annoying thing to point out. But wait, what kind of journalist is Gail Weathers? Then she's an investigative journalist, but also like a sensationally tabloid person who shows up and puts a microphone in front of people's faces. Yeah, that's weird. I, uh, she 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 also has a morning show that I, we never miss her show. She's she's everything. She yeah, she's just jerk. She's just reporter. I, I guess I take her as, as like a Geraldo Rivera, where like he had a show at one point. He's an investigative journalist, so he has these like specials as well. Plus, he'll take things that he goes through in the field and like make a book about it. But he's kind of like he's kind of scamming people. Am I saying the right name, Geraldo Rivera? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's what I take them to be. So she's she's a personality who does investigative shit that leads to a book. Uh, Sydney goes to spend the night with her best friend Tatum. They have a little slumber party. I have here a screenshot of Rose McGowan's PJs and her stuffed Don't animal. Call them- her jammy jams. No, pajamas. And uh, Lacey, you know, before I even complained about this while we were watching, she's like, people have pajamas, Matt. I thought you were not liking Sid's. I think hers are the most realistic no, things No, Sydney is just seen. wearing a t-shirt. That makes sense. People sleep in t-shirts. People With socks. Uh, 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 Rose McGowan is in like this, like, like from a cartoon, uh, heavy pajamas. She just needs a, f- a fucking like sleeping cap and a candle, but she's holding a, she's holding a giant stuffed animal. This is fucking sex pot. Rose McGowan, who again is probably 24 years old right, right. here. Um, anyway, that is just one thing that movies and TV cannot seem to get accurate is what people sleep in. Mm-hmm. I, I can count on one hand and I will, I guess if they're doing it right, I'm not even noticing. That's true. And also like, d- d- Hey, I get it. Women, everybody probably just doesn't want to be in the minimal amount of clothes that they actually sleep in, you mm. know, on camera when they're on a set for two straight days filming That's true. this slumber party sequence. But anyway, the phone rings. It's for you, Sydney. Oh, it's the killer. Hello, Sydney. I'm going to fucking brazen, kill. brazen for him to call the house that she's at with an officer of the law. But this means it can't be Billy or can it? Or can't it? Can it? <laughs> The next morning, we find out about this cotton weary thing. Sydney maybe false identified her, him as the mom's killer. Dewey drops them off at school, and she's like, "He's like, don't worry, Sid. It's school. You'll be safe here." And I guess in a pre-Columbine world, that was not supposed to be ironic. Yeah. Uh, she she sees 
Gail, she goes up to talk to Gail. Gail says the presents everything Lacey just said that like, you know, boy, maybe you're not so confident that that Cotton's the killer. Ooh, okay. Well, this is the, the scene where I start to feel comforted when Gail's around, but you just see the way that her and Sydney interact with each other and like they they don't like each other, but they seem to trust each other. Or like like you and I both don't want to die. Okay, cool. So like we're in this together. There's some, some of course Gail is still chasing like this amazing story and she is until the very last scene of the movie. Mm -hmm. But there's some there's caring in there too. And she does feel some sort of like motherly thing over Sid. You can just tell. I agree. I think it's and and when when at the end Sydney says, I like that story when when Gail comes in with the mm -hmm. gun and it's like, let me tell you two fucks a story. This suddenly you're like, oh, these two women who have been at odds are suddenly basically women need to stick together and they can overcome the patriarchy. But it is it's very gratifying when suddenly the they they are on each other's side. Which I think happens way earlier in the movie than you think. I think it happens right here in this scene. And I think it's still there's still some hostility, but I think um Sydney respects Gail. And and again, I'm telling you, it's the only adult in the room. I think there's some relief when she's around her. Mm -hmm. She just really like knows her, what's going on, has her head on a swivel in a way that the other adults don't. Um, Once Sydney leaves the scene, Courtney Cox is like super excited. And she talks to Kenny, her camera guy. And she's like, oh my God, I can get a Pulitzer. I can get a, a man off of death row. Oh my God. Um, now what would actually happen is the court would be like, we don't give a shit. He's already in prison. But he's already there. Yeah. You, you want stuff. us to reopen the case? All no, thank you. All the stuff's in there. Yeah. it's <laughs> The door sticks. You can't. No, I mean, Missouri literally just executed a man who even the prosecutor was like, no, not the man. That's not it. Don't do and it. They're like, sorry. We... Wait. It's a Friday. We're not going <laughs> to. Oh, God. Students are wearing the ghost face mask in the school. Sydney gets attacked in the bathroom. Like there, there she is. There's just way too much contact with Sydney and the killer. If this is actually the killer, is is this not in her head in the bathroom? What? No, of course it's real. The killer's already in there. He's about to there, and that killer's going to go kill the principal. Yes, now. that's what I'm saying. So it's it, it's just a little too much uh, uh, interaction between Sydney. And I think the killer. it's supposed to be our big clue that this is a student. That these are students. Well, we. I mean, okay. Of course, I, did, I, I think it's odd. I think it's it's definitely. I can't think of another movie where there's this much. I mean, maybe in Halloween, d there seems to be a lot of times that Michael sees um, Jamie, but it's all in one night. I, I, I guess with every serial killer movie, there needs to be the stalking, and this is their version of that. Mm -hmm. Go and get you. <laughs> But like, if the goal was to fucking kill her on the mother's death anniversary, why are you trying now? Why are you trying the next day? Wait, wait for the anniversary. I guess. Yeah, I guess they're not trying to kill her now. They're just trying to freak her out. Uh, yeah. And it's working. And then she goes and tells the principal, ah, Mr. Principal, the, the killer in the bathroom. And the principal's like, that's it. Classes are canceled for the I'm day. I'm sick of this in the bathroom business. And so all the kids leave school. They're like, all right. And they throw their papers in the air. And um, then Henry Winkler is left alone in what appears to be a re a, I think I remember this is just in reshoots. They're like, let's give Henry Winkler something to do. Mm -hmm. And so then the killer comes and kills him because it seems so disconnected from the rest of the movie. Does. But it does come back later in the movie. But you also need yet another adult, yet another person with access to Sydney at the school um, to give you that whodunit. You know, that's why there's so many. He's menacing with the. With the he he seems unhinged. He's acting a bit unhinged and a little too attached to his students the whole time. It's just another plausible I uh, li oh, help me plausible deniability yeah. moment. I forgot to mention there's a conversation with Sydney and Billy at school where he's like, "Listen, now that you know I'm not the killer, can we have sex?" And she's like, "I don't know, Billy." This is the most fucked up conversation he has with her the whole time. Where it's just like. So what's, what's your damage? <laughs> it's like, you're acting so, ugh. Um, but anyways, I'm sorry. My traumatized life, it's an inconvenience. And then she runs all bow-legged into the fucking bathroom. Well, before that, he's like, I mean, I think it's time you get over all of that. Yes, that's what he says. Uh, when my mom left my dad, right. I accepted it. Did Which, you? of course, the whole movie is because he didn't accept. Right. And that, that's why it's so delicious when she calls him a little mama's boy at the end. Pa a little mama's boy pansy. <laughs> yes, it is so good. That's right, he is. 
Then we have the video store scene between Stu and Randy. And Randy is, he also is a little nuts. So you're like, oh, I guess he might be the killer because he's right. just shouting about shit. You need all of Ranting them. and raving like a lunatic. I remember there being more, it is in the sequel where he starts laying out his like, there are rules to a sequel because in a sequel, this it, means that and this means that. He picks up the rules thing again, but the, right. Oh, you're saying you remembered that the rules I, I are just I misplaced that. I misplaced that into I this. Too. And he's, but really they're just like, anyone could be a suspect. It could be you. It could be me. And he's like, what's my motive? And Jamie Kennedy, uh, Randy is like, my motive is it's the millennium. Motives don't exist. And everyone's like, or, or Billy and Stu are both like, huh, millennium. I like that. Good word there, bud. Millennium. I guess in 96, millennium was a, like a novelty word. Yeah. Because it wasn't until like maybe 99 that people were saying it all the time. I think so. Uh, Sydney and Tatum. Are they in a Bucky's? No, they're not at a Bucky's. Why is that shit on the wall? It was a bird. I was like, is it? What, did the Bucky's mascot used to look really, really like photorealistic? It just it's looks like a it's some sort of red tail beer that they have both they have the bottles of beer and then a poster and then two merchandise shirts you yes can buy. sorry just all of a sudden it's like wait why is a squirrel on every single thing in this store have i never noticed they're at a bucky's yeah <laughs> just a real realistic squirrel not at a bucky's no. um the town is shutting down for curfew sydney and tatum are in the store buying supplies for the party tonight at Stu's house and then and and sydney's like oh, i feel so bad for billy all he wants to do is have sex with me and i'm just being such a bitch because i'm not doing it and Tatum's like, I wouldn't say that about yourself, really. And she's like, no, it's true. Um, how many guys will put up with a girlfriend who's sexually anorexic? I oh, think that might be my least favorite line in movies. Okay. Sexually anorexic. Fine. But what you you were bothered by this scene in this line before. And it, it seems like the, the overall concept is bugging you, too. Or you're just saying just the... It Do you is, not think this is a believable conversation between gr two girlfriends? I believe that. I believe, and it's not that it's not realistic it's that so someone's saying so much pressure to sexual, have sex. It's the phrase "sexually anorexic." Okay. That is a thirty-year-old writing a clever line. I hate it so much. I've never heard such a written line. Okay, but I will say the term "this um, anorexia and bulimia" were very thrown around at this age um, for for high school age girls it was something to joke about understood but yeah somebody said that and if somebody makes a turn of phrase like that the person who they're talking to is gonna be like wait what <laughs> or like oh good one. Oh, sydney yeah millennium i i know it's annoying for me to just complain it's about not. the quippiness and the like this doesn't no that's one of your pet peeves that's like a through line in this discovery we've made while doing the podcast, there are things that really bug the fuck out of you. And I'd say I even have a couple of them, Matt. So there's a party at <laughs> Stu's house. And, and everybody's coming. Yes, Except everyone's coming. Sid, because it's her first time having sex. Yeah, and it's, yeah, and then they're in, they're in the parents, they're in Stu's parents' bedroom. Smelling other mom smell. She you want to smell your own mom smell when you're having sex. She doesn't even have her own mom, though. Yeah. So that's when. So maybe she likes it. It's a real libido killer. Okay, go on. Um, yes, it's it's Stu's house and everyone's coming, even though there's a curfew, but Dewey the cop drops them off. I don't know what the deal is with the curfew. And uh, Dewey, then Gail Weathers shows up and, and starts flirting with Dewey and Dewey's like, well, hey, why don't I take you inside the party? And he comes in, he's like, look, I got a famous woman. And they're all like, oh, famous woman. And, uh, oh, and then, and, and, and she surreptitiously leaves a little camcorder that has a remote That's transmitter. Key. That's going to be key, Matt. It will be. Uh, oh, Matthew Lillard sends, uh, Stu sends his girlfriend, Tatum. Hey, go give me a beer, babe. And she's like, what am I, the beer, beer wench? wench? She says it to herself, but he's sending her off to her death. Uh, Which has to be Billy killing, right? Because Stu was in the other he's room. He's inside, yeah. Uh, Dewey brings Gail into the house. And Tatum's like, well, before Tatum becomes a beer wench, she's like, what is she doing here? And I like that he exci he's like excited. He's like, she's with me. <laughs> and then she's Pulling like, bitches. Um, take your media muff out of here. Your media muff. muff. Mm. Oh, no. The guy Kids, n no one says muff. That is such an old fart word. I'm always impressed at this. Uh, this is my favorite kill. But I always trick myself into thinking she's going to get away. Like there's something about It's my her. favorite kill where she lives. 
she's just so damn competent. Mm -hmm. She is fighting back great. She's got amazing aim with those beer bottles. That because she goes into the garage to get a lot of beers, all the beers. And then the killer comes. He's like, huh, very funny, Randy. Move aside. Randy really must be up to some bullshit hijinks in, yeah, what in else earlier is he years. Yes. God, Randy. He's the annoying guy from every Friday the 13th movie who's like, I'm the killer. No, just kidding. Only it's just me, Shelly. He's not. He uh, just keeps being accused of it. <laughs> like, yeah. He's not ever once done anything except for take it really seriously. And he's like screaming from the rooftops. It's Billy. You know what else? <laughs> well, two things. One, they keep saying scary movie instead of horror movie. Number two, mm. um, we know lots of people who love horror and, and, and I love horror movies and you love horror movies. Mm -hmm. um, it's not like my identity, but I know people who make it their identity. Yeah. I don't think they are like, you know what I love is scaring people in real life. But wait, you're saying you think the movie thinks that? Is the movie suggesting that if you love horror movies, a thing that you enjoy doing is dressing up as a killer to scare the people you know? No, no, no. I think that we are supposed to be, because he's the one that has all this knowledge of, I don't know, Matt, Actually, honestly, but I, I think they're just trying to make you think that, okay, he's the goofy friend. Mm -hmm. Goofy friend of goofy things. Yeah. My own boyfriend would know not to do this. There's no way Billy would do this. What other male do I know that would be so comfortable with me that he'd do this? I guess, answer, Randy. Okay. I guess it's not so much that we all have a friend like this. It's that we all have to narrow down our group of friends to who would actually fucking do this. It's Who's so annoying? dumb. Right. It is. It's, it's very annoying. I'm, I'm pissed. I'm just saying people who love movies, a thing about us is that we don't do stuff. We like to watch, not do stuff. Um, Seems like a lot of effort to like go get that costume. Yes, exactly. Wait for someone to go in the fucking. And what if she drops all the beer? She. It's not like she grabs one. She's grabbing a quarter of the beer. You don't scare her. No. Uh -uh. But uh, the, so the the killer comes in. Then I'm going to kill you. And Wes Craven is Can just. Oh, oh, Mr. Serial Killer. I'm sorry. She just goes into sex kitten so easy. What he is so great at in, mm -hmm. in these movies, in, in Nightmare on Elm Street, in uh, his movie Red Eye, in People Under the Stairs, is put a killer and the victim in a room. Where no one else can hear. And have them, uh, have there being chases around the room, use the objects in the room, mm. gets like the geography and the geometry uh, and film it in such a way that it is scary and thrilling. And that's what, that's what makes these movies God, so special. So and this right. is one of the best. You're so right. And, and like, you can point to the different locations in each movie where they, like he really gets some magic out of it. I mean, obviously in the theater, but then there's one in like a sound booth. That's so good. Um, and then I want to say in the last movie or maybe the second to last, movie, whatever one was the last one that Gail and Dewey are in, it's some kind of barn kind of like there's like a second level to the barn and they're having a party and oh yeah i just remember i don't remember the movie very well but that was like god he's good with this i think my favorite sequence in any scream movies in scream 2 there's just a part where sydney and somebody else i don't remember who else are in the car and the killer's oh, right outside god, the car i can't no no he's in the car and or they have to the get car. over him okay they, yes they've made him pass out and they both have to get out through the same door yes, that he's yes, sitting yes. in and oh, the I setup that couldn't one. be more simple, and it is so, so tense and thrilling. I'm glad that you like it because it stresses me the fuck out, and I guess that makes it good, but I have a hard time with it. But yeah. Um, and I think that might be why it was even harder for me to like go down a slasher journey with you after these movies being so staple in my life, then to visit uh, Halloween and um, Friday the 13th, because... It's not elaborate at all. You don't spend very much time on each kill at all. And Halloween, you take more time. But especially with Friday the 13th, then he just gets it fucking done. And just like, on to the next one. On the next. I guess I just um, expected a, a more elaborate shit with each. These are certainly more character-based, so mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're more up your alley. Uh, but, you know, most of, the, most, of the, most of the Friday the 13th and Halloween movies don't have a director this good. Right. Um. But yeah, the, she gets killed because she tries to escape through a doggy door and then the killer turns on the garage door. This is the world's strongest garage door Ever. because it traps her. I mean, when I was like seven years old, I would try to ride up the garage door and my friend broke it as a result. You know, my 60 pound friend. <laughs> uh, so anyway, a plot hole. Uh, but then, you know, she, she gets killed this way and, she, and then she gets turned into a dummy, which is great. I love that you can tell it's a dummy. It's like it's movie oh. magic. 
Um, all the people are in the house watching the film Halloween. And this stresses me out because they're talking during all the best parts of the movie. Uh, Billy shows up to uh, make up with Sid. And then they go up to the parents' bedroom. And Sidney's like, hey, I'm so sorry. I've been such a bitch. I think it's time to turn my life into a porno. And so they have sexual intercourse. And while the kids downstairs are watching TV, they're talking about things like, uh, you know, oh, here comes the obligatory tit shot while upstairs, you know, she takes off her shirt. Mm. Uh, and then Randy starts giving out his rules about surviving a horror movie. And this really mainstreamed the idea of the, uh, the final girl has to be a virgin, yeah. which people like John Carpenter have said like, that is total bullshit. Uh, that was never, that was never at least consciously what we were doing. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's like whole academic papers about, about, uh, interpreting the idea that it has to be a virgin who su survives horror movies. And there's a billion examples of that of course. not being the case. My, my take has always been like sex is when you are most vulnerable. So it right, is like often shitting or sleeping shit, sleep, shower, sex. Mm -hmm. It's all the times you're not paying attention or naked. And then afterward it's, 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 and it's your most vulnerable. And afterward, maybe your brain's not working as good. For sure. So yeah, no sex and no drinking or drugs. And they're all like, no. Um, Must you? What the fuck, Matt? Why? Why do you always have these intense faces in your freaking gonna kiss about to fuck? I don't need to see this. All right. Well, Lacey, when I make my sled shows, I'm going as fast as I can. We have so much to do. Right. It's not like I'm like, Ooh, what's the perfect screenshot I can get? I truly am going so All right. fast. It just feels it's like never it's intentional. too fuck with me. Okay. Fine. No, I mean, occasionally it is, but no, not this case. I just <sighs> wanted to show to know? Billy and, and Billy and Sid uh, making love. And then when they're done, Billy's like, are you okay? Which is my favorite. I, I wrote Every down, girl wants to Lacey hear that. Lacey soaked her jeans when she saw this. Um, not from Billy. But then Sid starts to get suspicious of Billy again. But why? What does he say or let slip? She just has a moment of clarity after the sex for some reason and and says, who did you call whenever you were in jail? It just comes to her. Does she see a phone and go, oh, phone. Who did you call? I don't know. But just saying, it'd be a, it'd be, it'd be a really smart way for you to throw me off your trail if you used your one phone call. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't, though. And he's like... I don't think you can't. I think, Why? I think it's like anybody going through something really traumatic with someone that they care about. They don't want it to be true. So I think she's like happy to. Okay, God. Okay, good. He, he couldn't have called me from jail. So police officers, it's not it's not him. And and but then but then he's so fucking weird to her and shitty to her. So she walks away and doesn't want to see him. But then she does see him. And it's like, I've been stressing out thinking about are you a fucking killer? And maybe I need to get you back on my good side if you are or I just want to go back to like normalcy and where I have a loving boyfriend. Let's go fuck. And then the, the thought creeps in again. And then he's weird again. And it's like, you can try to convince yourself that someone's not dangerous a bunch of times before they prove that they are. It's it's ignoring red flags. That's all it is. Okay, and then it'll just keep coming back. And classic. If he wasn't the killer, abusive. She, eight years from now, she'd still be like, "So Billy, you you totally not the killer, oh, right?" Yeah. And he was like, "Why am I gonna have to keep an answer?" It's because in between these moments, Billy, you're a little fucking weird. <laughs> it's because you stare out at the rain and you're mad your at beard. every drop for some <laughs> reason. Uh, you don't answer questions normal. But the killer comes and kills Billy. And we get another really great Wes Craven chase through the house, which we've now observed the geometry of the, or the geography of the house and the mm -hmm. dueling staircases that lead to this little hallway. And Sid makes it out of the house through the attic and down into the, uh, the grounds. She ends up in the um, news van where Kenny the news van is. And because we've had this great setup with the, uh, the delay of the video camera, right. we can see back in the past that Jamie Kennedy as a, as, as Randy is watching Halloween by himself. And he keeps talking to Jamie, Jamie Lee Curtis. And he's like, look out, Jamie, Jamie. Jamie, no, he's behind you. He's right behind you. But he's saying his own name. As Jamie Kennedy is, has the killer right behind him. I did want to point out that one, you even had the subtitle on the slot, the screen shot that you used that one of the things those kids are talking about while they're trying to watch the movie um is oh it's so red it's the next one um 
that the blood is too red. Like, why would they? Why would they use that kind of blood? It's too red. And then they, then Billy gets fake stabbed. Yeah, you're right. And corn syrup comes out of him. Mm-hmm. They mention corn syrup here. He says corn syrup later. You're right. That's a great observation, love. I'm observant. Uh, the, the, and in this one, they're like, "Look, here comes the obligatory tit shot." And then PJ Sol- Souls shows her tits, and they're all like, "Yeah!" But then the women are like. Ugh. These scuzz balls. It's exactly the kind of viewing experience I remember having in high school. Really? Yes. Yeah, so with everyone's like, oh, that's lame. Oh, that's stupid. Oh, that's sexist. Oh, that's fun. Oh, that makes me hot. It's it's all just like, we're watching this so that we're going to fuck later or do drugs later, right? It's never just to watch a Again, movie. Again, this is like Mar- describing life on Mars to me. Never had that experience. I had a huge group of friends. We always try to watch a movie and it's like, this is, it's not really what we're doing. I mean, even our movie friends will talk about, I had some friends over, so we put on a movie and I'm like, I'm sorry, what? Well, I guess that's what I assume people mean when they say it's a hangout movie. It's like something you can kind of accept that you're not going to really see the whole thing of it. You're hanging out. I know. I I invite you to watch movies with me, and that's about that's about it. Yeah, uh, yeah, you're you're hard. You are tricky I'm, to watch a movie. And I with. know I'm representative of a normal person, so 100%. Yes. Um the uh I I I just I love the I love the idea to have the camera show inside the house, they're in the news van watching it, they're watching the killer, and then they realize there's a 30 second delay and they look outside and then the killer's right there. It's just this, it's it's really kind of a trippy, it's such a simple idea, but it's so trippy to see him on TV and then look outside and he's right there and it's like he teleported and he kills Kenny the camera guy, but Kenny heroically says to Nev Campbell, no, close the door. So Nev Campbell does, and then she escapes, and then she runs away, and then gets into a car, and Ghostface like stalks her there. And- She's good at making the doors lock, though. Mm-hmm. Getting that lock, he unlocks it. Get that lock. How can you? Uh, one day we'll get an old car, and we'll see. Is this actually something you can do? Is just go under it and m- unlock the door? Sony did. He had the keys. He. No, but he was looking- doing it from under the car. He was unlocking the car from under the car. He wasn't. Yes, he was. He was just crouched down, unlocking it through the key. That's what he was doing? Yes, Matt. That's why there's time to hit it after he unlocks it. You have to take a key, unlock it. Then you you put the keys away, open the door. really long arms. You're laying down on the ground. You're reaching up with your arm to do that? No, Matt. Yes, Lacey. He's just. He's like, under the car. No, he's not. He's just doing this. Okay. It's a crouch. All right. Good God. No, no, definitely just under it. Just like, what the? F- That's less never- scary. Why are it's you so No, ma- it's not less scary. It's more scary because he's, if you are a good croucher, if you've got, if you're athletic at all, you can run like that. So he's like, that's what's crazy. It's like, where is he going to pop out? Oh my God. I can't see him. This is maybe it's because of all my experience with but this is the half the games we play with him is i get really low so he doesn't know what side of a piece of furniture i'm gonna pop out from. all right i have a question mm-hmm. why does this make you so mad I don't know. when i misunderstand something like this like you get <laughs> so furious i think you might be reading it as me being mad i'm just more like amused yeah well i'm amused you yeah, amuse me a lot of fun oh <laughs> <sighs> no but the, 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 the scariest thing in the movie to me is the moment when he drops down and goes, well, I guess he doesn't go under the car. He can just drop down and crouch down, but just not seeing him anymore right. is like, oh, shit. Of course. Now he can be anywhere. Like It's scary to see him, but it's scarier when he goes. She gets out of the car. She runs back to the house. Randy and Stu are both there, and they're both like, he's the killer. No, he's the killer. No, he's the killer. So good. You gotta believe me, Sid. She finds a gun. She's like, fuck you both, and then goes into the house. Oh, because Dewey stumbled out of the house. He was stabbed. We don't see him get stabbed, which is weird. Um, I guess we can't because who who did he get stabbed by? Uh, mm, mm-hmm. uh, so she locks herself in and then Billy stumbles down the stairs. And she's like, oh, Billy, you're alive. He's like, yes, I'm alive. I'm okay. Feeling all right. Feeling like I could take on the whole empire myself. Need a cup of coffee. And uh, she, she lets Randy in and Randy's like, oh, Stewie's going mad. And then Billy's like, we all go a little mad sometimes. And shoots him dead. What? Does he just let Randy in? Okay. All right. And so reveals himself. He's the killer. And then he's like, Anthony Perkins, psycho. <laughs> and thus begins, you know, the 20-minute stretch where Stu 
and Billy Reveal, where the killers were in on it together. And Love and, it. and Matthew favorite. Lillard is playing this at, at 10,000. God, he's going so big. It's best. It's best because he would be so heightened. He'd be giddy with joy. They've been planning this shit for a year. Like, because, you know, they attempted to do. I don't really get it. Like, I know Billy killed the mom a year ago, but was Stu in on it yet? I don't know. I don't know about that. And what was the point of waiting a year just to like. It's the anniversary of a death. I don't. That's not what I mean. I mean, why not kill all of them right then? But why get mad at. If you didn't think to kill Sid then, but you are still dating her for some reason. Oh, he needed to fuck. He did. And I don't think he started dating her until his dad left his mom for Sydney's mom. His mom, mom left. Then he's like, I shall be now begin my multi-phase plan. Go out with this lady on a date. Would you like to go get coffee with me? Talk to her on this first date. What do you talk about? Pretend that I'm not a psychopath and my mom left for her mom or whatever <laughs> over the course of two years. Woo the lady. And then he's like, yeah, because our, because of our horror movie obsession, we need, I need to bed her and then she can die because of our rules. Sure. But it just occurred to me that he waits to kill her after he's fucked. Mm -hmm. after he fucked her. But the whole movie is about him trying to get her to fuck. So if she would have fucked him in the first scene where he comes through her window, I have to kill her right after that. Okay. Did, did, so that's what I was saying. I don't think it was about Maybe the not. don't think it was about the anniversary at all. I think he just thought he'd get some a lot sooner. She might have caused her mother's death. Oh my god! If she would have just put out, it would have settled the score. He'd have gotten it out of his system. Yeah, he just and needed a nut. He, well, he needed it tit for tat. Like, okay, your your mom's gonna fuck up my life. I need your pussy to to renew my life. Then you can all live. You really thinking about this? Yeah, I mean, it's a good point. If you're if you're a teenager and you have a boyfriend, or if you have a partner who has a penis, you just need to fuck them because they might kill uh, you kill or your you mom or someone you love. And that's what the that's that's what Low Bear Beams is here to is here to tell you. If you don't think you're ready, if, I can't. Why am I saying this? <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> So they're like, but what's your motive? And he's like, did Norman Bates have a motive? Yes. Well, yes, he did. Yes, he did. Did they ever decide why Hannibal Lecter liked to eat people? Yeah. It's better when there's no motive, but here's my motive. And then he reveals he has a motive. Mm. And I like that you can see on Stu's face, he seems a little betrayed. Because mm. I think this is the first time he's ever actually heard this. And I think he was like, I thought you had like an actual ideology, but no, it's just about stupid revenge. But then he like adjusts. Wait. You think you think this is his, no? He, I think Matthew on Matthew Lillard's face is like he's hearing this for the first time. When when Billy is like, "Well, how about this for a motive? Your slut mother. You're 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 picking up on the right thing, but for the wrong reason. He knows about the past with with the mom and who Billy is and all that. What what I think Matthew's let down by is that he didn't come up with an with a motive or an alibi or anything like that. I think he feels like. You didn't tell me we were going to have motives. <laughs> like, I, okay. no, you're right. I guess it doesn't make sense. He does. I don't know. Uh, but also he's already been stabbed, right? So maybe he's already starting to kind of realize. No, I don't think so. Okay. I don't know. Stu definitely starts to get the sense that he's always been meant to die from that first, that first stab being just goes too far in. And he's like, wait a minute. Well then, I mean, I think that's it. It's like, the, the, yeah, this means something different to this guy. And yeah. I've all, I'm taken for granted that he's all totally on my side. Mm -hmm. I don't remember if they start stabbing each other before Gail comes in or after, but Gail comes in with a gun. She's like, I've got a story for you. You fucks, you fuckos. Here we go. And Billy's like, Hey bitch, safety's not on the safety's on the gun. And then knocks her out. Um, but then they turn around and Stu is like, um, where's Sydney? Sydney. And the gun. And the gun are gone. And the dad. She is fast. And she's calling from inside the house. And you, when the phone rings, you got to answer it. So mm -hmm. Stu picks it up and he's been stabbed. Oh, I love, I, Ooh. sorry. I, I love my favorite part of the movie. My favorite line of the movie is after they, they start stabbing each other because their idea is they're going to bring out Sydney's dad. They're going to make it look like he killed himself and they were stabbed, but they're going to live. Yeah. But it involves them having to stab each other. Yeah. And Billy goes a little too, gets a little too nuts with stabbing Stu. And he's like, that was really deep, man. Yeah. 
But I love when he's just like, fuck, man, that was really deep. I think I'm dying, man. <laughs> My favorite part is whenever he hands him the phone too rough and he's like, hit me with the that phone. That too, yes. Dick. No, no, he, he, <laughs> Billy throws it at him. He throws it at his head. He's like, ah, oh, he threw me at the phone, dick. Because he was so badly stabbed the first time and he gets stabbed a, a good bit before Billy ever gets stabbed at all. Billy gets stabbed one time. Stu gets stabbed in the middle. It was supposed to be on the side. He gets stabbed in the middle. That is fucking key. Mm-hmm. And and so he's all he's begun dying before he ever. He's still excited though. This is still gonna work out. I'm still. Uh, this is gonna work out. Um, then he stabs Billy one time in the same way that's agreed upon. And for some reason, Billy then stabs a bunch of more times because he doesn't want him to live. Because he's a liability. Yeah. This is, it's like the opening of Dark Knight. You, you you can't actually leave any accomplices. You have to shoot them all. Um, but I, but it's, it's Matthew Lillard. It's kind of sweet here the way I he's know. playing it as he's dying. And he's talking, he picks up the phone. He's like, "Talk to me, Sid. Did you really call tell the cops? Mom. No. Did you really tell? Are you really going to tell my mom and dad? No. Did you, did really? you call the cops? Yeah. My, yeah. Yeah. That they're going to tell my mom. My mom and dad are so mad at me. <laughs> Plus, this is all happening at your house. Your house is a mess. No party, Stu, while we're gone. Uh, but uh, Sydney overpowers Stu by dropping a TV on him. Billy jumps on top of Sydney and she gets him off of her by pushing in on his stab wound. Mm-hmm. Some penetration. This is now the woman taking over. Okay. I just like the, I like uh, that uh, uh, as a means of, of, uh, of hurting somebody. Is, is pushing in on their wound. I do too, yeah. And then, what's wrong with what I just said? You were, you just I never really noticed your fascination with like the penetration stuff in slasher movies. That's all, all I think about. That's, when Gail you're comes gooning in, over there. I mean, we're always gooning, are we not? So Gail comes in and he, sh- I don't even know what gooning is. So Gail comes gooning in. is prolonged masturbation, like to the point of delirium. Oh, then yeah, we are always, always gooning. Well, but you're edging, we? you're not, you're not actually coming. You're just edging the whole time. Again, that's what we're always doing, isn't it? <laughs> so Gail comes in, shoots Billy. He jumps up one more time. Sydney shoots him. So the two women, female solidarity working together, have overpowered the killer with no doubt about it. And Sydney, I like definitively, Sydney just shoots him in dead. In the head. Uh, I think that slasher purists object to there being guns. And I kind of agree. I don't really want guns in my slasher movies. It's not that I don't want them to shoot. It's not the victims can have the gun, can shoot the killer. I don't oh, want the yeah. killers to have a gun because yeah. they do use the gun. Um, and that's it. And the movie, I love that this movie, which has so much plot, I always assume like, well, you're going to see like the next morning, Cotton Weary is out of jail. And mm-hmm. for a movie to pack so much plot in, there's usually now a coda where you wrap up all the storylines, but no, Gail Weathers starts talking into a camera and then the movie's just over. Yeah. So that's, that's Scream. 